market research. We have a great session coming up on market research. Let's learn about how this team is using technology to enhance market insights. I'd like to introduce Kevin Kivlin, FAS Regional Case Director, Christy Wilbur, Tiffany Shabanian, and Jen Crook, who are all Federal Acquisition Service Market Research Analysts. Team, the virtual platform is yours. Thanks, Mary. Good afternoon, everybody. Hope everybody had a great break um, and a great long weekend. I know um, it was nice to have the holiday and I hope you all had a happy Juneteenth. So thanks so much for joining us to discuss market research as a service today. Um, my name is Kevin Kivlin. I've been with GSA for uh, just over 17 years now, uh, where I've been a contracting officer, uh, program manager, and now I'm a director for uh, case or GSA's customer and stakeholder engagements division uh, in GSA New England. I'm also uh, the competition advocate for GSA New England, and uh, I'm really excited to be with you all today to talk about market research. Uh, it's something that we're very proud about uh, in, in FAS, and uh, we're looking forward to explaining more to you about. Today, I'm joined by Christy Wilbur, who's the branch chief for MRAS, and Jen Crook and Tiffany Shabanian. So let's, let's jump in. So today we're gonna to share some innovative ways uh, we do market research at GSA for our clients, which include using RPA, uh, our customer experience management platform, open APIs um, and uh, other technologies such as uh, Google for collaboration. Uh, we call our program MRAS and we're extremely proud of it because we've, we've helped over 3,000 federal, uh, federal programs with their requirements. Uh, we've supported all CFO agencies and thousands of program managers and contract specialists. So basically what this means is uh, we're doing more market research across more requirements than any other organization in the government. And we have tons of experience and best practices we love to share with other federal buyers uh, like yourselves and our goal is to make it really easy for industry to engage with uh, the government around potential requirements um, so they can sell their solutions. So um, I'm going to uh, give a little bit of overview of our, what we do on a regular basis now. We pride ourselves on the technology that we're using, like I mentioned just a moment ago. Uh, we use RPAs, which is robotic process automation, APIs, customer experience management platforms, CRMs and collaboration tools to enable an automated and seamless experience for federal buyers and in industry. Using this tech, we provide both buyers, uh, we provide buyers with a catalog of research questions, existing market reports, and the ability to collect feedback about their requirements or see what industry suggests in terms of solutions through data that we collect on their behalf. Additionally, we often combine this tech with industry days and other industry engagement activities, which uh, we'll share with you in a moment. So now I'm gonna pass it to Christy Wilbur to discuss our three primary services. Thanks, Kevin. Hello, everyone. So um, here's a summary of the types of services that can be found with MRS. The MRAS program currently offers um, actually four different services now. Um, the first is for products only, while the other two are more focused on service type of requirements. The first is um, the GSA Advantage product market research tool, which lets you search up to 20,000 items on GSA Advantage at once. Um, again, this is for market research for products only. Um, the second is a rapid review. This tells our customers if the requirement fits the scope of an existing GSA um, acquisition solution. We usually have those results to you in less than 24 to 48 hours. And the third is the MRAS RFI in the market research report. This targets your market research to the right contractors, the right contracts, and it is consolidated into one report with visuals. The newer service that we're um, offering, and like I said, it's very new, um, we will, are having a new service that's going to involve industry engagement um, where we can invite our federal partners um, to discuss a current MRAS RFI with a group of vendors 
who attend our monthly MRAS training sessions. So now let me share with you some of the success of the program to date. So since fiscal year 20, the MRAS program has awarded over 50% of all requirements researched to GSA contract holders, resulting in a total lifetime value of all contracts awarded of over 22 billion. The program has grown tremendously. More and more federal and state and local agencies are using GSA's market research as a service because they are able to quickly get market research results on demand. Last fiscal year, the MRAS team posted 766 RFIs for various agencies. And in this fiscal year, we have already posted over 740. So we are well on our way to surpass last year number. The Air Force, Army, and GSA's Federal Acquisition Service continues to be our top customer who use MRAS. Our most utilized MRAS service is the MRAS Request for Information, or RFI. We are enabled by technology to deliver results in as little as a day, but most of the time in three weeks or less. We work with you and your customer service director to understand your requirements and to help build a custom RFI so that we can engage industry efficiently. After we collect the data, we then organize the results in an easy to read report. By visiting our webpage at www.gsa.gov backslash MRAS, you can access the MRAS service request form. Once you've submitted your request through this form, we will begin customizing your RFI for you. We follow a standard so industry knows what to expect. Our questions are built around how we want to visualize the data for our customers. So wherever possible, we ask yes, no questions and then ask industry to expand in a streamlined capability statement. The screenshot on the left-hand side of the slide is showing what the MRAS RFI survey typically looks like. In this RFI, as with all of our RFIs, we include a description of the scope and a date for when the responses are due. We include standard questions, such as whether uh, the firm was submitted an offer or not, what GSA contracts they hold in any sense or special item numbers or the NAICS codes numbers that are applicable to the requirement. We also ask industry about their business size and socioeconomic designations so that we can summarize in an easy to read report all the available small businesses that can meet your requirements. We, we then ask them to answer specific technical questions about the requirement. As you can see on the right hand side of the slide, in this section, we can customize the way questions are laid out. We can have sliding scales, drop down choices, or multiple choice. It all really just depends on the need. We also offer industry the opportunity to offer feedback on the requirement, which we will then summarize for you in the report. Finally, they are also able to include a capability statement, which we provide a link to in the final market research report. Once we receive the responses, we produce the easy to understand report that racks and stacks the data points to visualize the results so decision makers like yourself can think about and create acquisition strategies. MRAS market research reports provide a comprehensive view that gives you a socioeconomic outlook, a summary of industry feedback, and narratives to leverage acquisition planning all in one report. This is an example of a market research report for the VA we did around their artificial intelligence workforce. The report summarizes the requirement and provides a recommendation based on the number of responses, as you can see on the right-hand side of the slide. We put together visualizations based on the questions in the RFI. Here, you can see that there were 20 interested parties, and of those 20, 12 were small businesses. The following pages of the report, as you can see here on the left-hand side of the slide, includes additional charts that show the GSA contracts these vendors hold, the recommended SINs or NAICS codes, and a breakdown of the business size and socioeconomic status. This gives you a quick snapshot and overview of the available market for this particular requirement. The chart on the right 
summarizes the number of respondents who can meet the requirement based on the technical questions that were asked in the MRAS RFI survey. We also include a list of all the interested sources with their point of contact information, a link to their website and what SINs they hold. The report includes links to the vendor's capability statements that they have uploaded with their response to the RFI. This feature makes it easier to keep all the pertinent documents in one place. And finally, we summarize industry feedback to you so that you can be sure the statement of work addresses any of their concerns and the requirement is clearly defined. I'd also like to point out that for our customers who are maybe working with a shorter time frame, we do have a database of over a thousand MRAS reports that we can access to provide our customers with previous market research data to quickly help you with all of your market research needs. I'm gonna pass it back over to Kevin now to tell you about one of our use cases and to finish out our slides. Kevin, back to you. Thanks, Christy, great job. So I'm gonna take you through um, some a, a recent example that we did with one of our clients uh, who are using the MRAS services. Um, so you may have heard earlier from our ATNF partner that uh, they just they hate asking for um, capability statements, and and we hold the same sort of premise. That's why we love to tailor our our RFIs and industry engagements specific to the requirements that are at hand. So in this instance, the GSA's Technology and Transformation Service contact, contacted us for assistance with their artificial intelligence and machine learning requirements. They wanted to gain some instant insights from potential vendors who could provide these types of services and about different services that were emerging within the market. After we worked with the TTS team to create a customized RFI, we invited them to meet with industry during a facilitated GSA session. The customer was able to review the RFI with industry, answer industry's questions live, and provide direction on how to best respond to the, the request for information that we published. As a result, within four weeks, the MRAS team was able to deliver a comprehensive report that identified 420, 419 small businesses out of 597 interested parties who responded. But most importantly, the TTS organization was able to collect data and learn from industry about what were the emerging concepts within AI and machine learning so they could better define their requirements um, and, and advise their clients on what, what, was, what, was the, what was it that was coming up in AI and machine learning. Now I wanna show you, um, now that we showed you what MRAS can do, I'd like to talk about some of the benefits. So I'm going to deviate a little bit from this slide because uh, I, th I think the, the main benefit here is we're able to customize and help you as a federal buyer define your requirements through, through various services. We're able to do RFIs. We're able to uh, help you define your requirements through industry days, but also collect feedback on your drafts, SUs, SOWs, PWSs, uh, and more. We're also there to help you engage industry in an efficient manner. So we're a full service, so you don't have to worry about any of the research steps, including reports or answering industry questions. We take you through that, we do it for you, and we work with you to make sure you're asking the right questions to industry um, and giving you questions all along um, to ask industry to help you better define what you're trying to buy. And then on top of that, we give you ex access to existing and new, and new data related to your requirement, industry feedback, socioeconomic information, tons of technical information, and, and more, all related to the market that you're targeting. And then finally, we, we give you a view of the competition and plug and play information for your acquisition plans. In terms of industry, we get amazing, amazing feedback from industry all the time about how easy it is to engage with our RFIs. Um, of course, we get, we're constantly improving because industry gives us feedback on ways we should be improving. And we're actually collaborating with the digital experience team, the buy.gsa.gov team to bring MRAS into that ecosystem. So industry will be able to reuse their information and work within uh, a login framework to, to respond to our RFIs. 
So what's what's most important for industry is that over 15, 50% of the requirements that we're, we're researching end up actually being a purchase uh, by the government under a GSA contract. So when we, when we go out with a requirement, there's a high, high likelihood that that requirement is going to go under a GSA contract. And as we all know, it's very difficult for industry in terms of business development and identifying where those next opportunities are coming. We've got plenty of researches, re resources for you. The slides will be coming to you. We hold monthly events for both industry and customers. And we really, really appreciate your time today and uh, want to help you define your requirements and identify the markets to, uh, to go to. So uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to email us or go visit our website uh, on this slide. Thanks, everyone. I hope you have a great day. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate that. Um, we, were, we will get to the questions in our Q&A document uh, that will be provided after the event. So all of you can uh, have those answers uh, in written format. Um, just look for that after the event. Next up, let's join DHS Procurement Innovation Team and explore innovative techniques that shorten time to award, improve competition, reduce barriers to non-traditional vendors, and improve mission outcomes. We have some special guests from the Department of Homeland Security to help us with this. From the Department of Homeland Security Procurement Innovation Lab, please welcome David Jablonski, Customer Engagement Lead, and Monica Taylor, innovation coach. Welcome, David and Monica. All right, thank you very much. And welcome everybody to the one point, uh, to the 1900 people out there that are tuning in today. Thank you very much, you guys, for joining us. I really appreciate it. Uh, so we have a, a great session for you guys here where, where Monica and I are gonna talk about procurement innovation techniques uh, to really improve the mission outcomes. And uh, as I just introduced, my name is David Jablonski. I'm the DHS uh, Procurement Innovation Lab Customer Engagement Lead. And I'm Monica Taylor. I'm a Procurement Innovation Coach, also with the Bill. All right, so really excited <laughs> to talk to you guys. So we're going to talk about innovations, right, that you can use at any stage of your procurement. So this is pre-solicitation phase, solicitation phase, and even your evaluations. And so we're going to really share these acquisition innovation techniques through stories. We like stories at the pill. If you've been, if you've heard from the pill, you know, we like stories here, but these, we're going to share these through act, actual stories, actual projects that were coached by the procurement innovation lab team. So by the end of this session, you should have a better understanding of how teams have used different procurement innovation techniques to really streamline the procurement process from both for both vendors and the evaluation teams. Perfect. So uh, before we hop in, though, uh, we want to go over a little bit who we are. But uh, earlier on today, right at the beginning of this conference, we kicked off and there was actually a poll question that was asked by the FAST conference, right? And I was wondering where you guys were. So the majority of people here today said they were from the government. Uh, we also had about, I think it's like 13 or 14 percent from industry itself. And on the government side, majority of the respondents that came back said that you guys are part of the acquisition stack, you know, those contracting officers, contract specialists. Uh, we also have program managers sprinkled in there as well. So just so you guys know, all these techniques are techniques that teams have used as part of the actual procurement innovation process. And that's the program managers using them, also uh, the contracting officers taking the lead. And, uh, and so that's what we wanted to share here today. Now, a little bit about the pill before we hop into these stories. So the Procurement Innovation Lab was developed in 2015, and it was to provide a safe space for teams to test new ideas, share lessons learned, and also promote best practices across the DHS acquisition community, and now the government-wide acquisition community. So the pill was designed for acquisition teams, you know, the contracting officer, program manager, procurement attorney, uh, and to obtain formal or informal support. And us as pill coaches or consultants on the acquisition during that obtained phase or contract formation phase, you know, solicitation, evaluation, award phase. And we do this by through bi-weekly meetings or sprint chats all the way through contract award. Now, 
uh, while the pill actually started just supporting DHS only. Just within the last couple of years, we're actually supporting teams outside of DHS too, uh, as they look to use these procurement innovation techniques. And so what we're doing this, we're doing this through a testing and sharing, that's our framework. And so a continuous feedback cycle of testing, sharing, we identify those projects, teams step into the lab, and one of the things, unlike a tiger team, right, that just uh, takes over and promises results, our job is really to act as that resource to provide that support, but leave the organization CEO in the driver's seat as they work to incorporate those innovation, act, innovation techniques that you're going to hear today. But after that award, we obtain actual feedback from the customer and we even call up the vendors, successful and unsuccessful, and give feedback on the innovation techniques. But ultimately what we're doing, we're doing this, we're infusing these innovation techniques into procurements to really lower the entry barriers for innovative non-traditional contractors. You see, they're shorten the time to award, uh, encourage competition and really increase the likelihood of successful outcomes by really re refining those evaluation techniques to really identify the most qualified contractors. So whether a project is successful or even if something fails along the way or doesn't work as intended, the pill really wants to highlight those successes. And our senior leadership, they support that. Senior leadership and our team acknowledges that failure is a true measure of progress and learning. So that continuous feedback cycle of testing, receive, receiving feedback, sharing, and retesting just fosters our learning culture. So that's what we're trying to do with the pill and which we're going to hopefully change how everyone does business. So we're here to share today. All right. And part of that uh, sharing that we have, you guys, so we got two stories ahead of you here. All right. So the first story, the one you see on the left, uh, this is the story of a team at U.S. Uh, Customs and Immigration Services, USCIS, within the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, so in this story, we're actually going to cover a lot of the pre-solicitation techniques that your teams can use. Uh, we're going to cover three of them, and you guys can use those pretty immediately as you get back to the job and your next procurements. And then the next story that we really want to highlight, that second one is one of our external coaching teams from the National Park Service. And so you'll hear more about how this team took a really innovative approach to their oral presentations and how they use some efficient evaluation techniques to get to award fast. But first, you'll hear the first story. <laughs> All right. That's right, Monica. So uh, the first story, USQISD. All right. So here, as you can see on this page, this is where we want to share with you guys what their evaluation approach was. Uh, so you can see this team used a, uh, this was a FAR 16.505 requirement, approximately $84 million. And uh, this is a small business set aside as well. So they used a two phase approach as part of the procurement process. And the first phase, it was, as you can see here, it was a written approach, okay? Uh, what's really neat here, that prior experience, look at that, 500 words. So for each response, and so they had five specific questions that this team asked for vendors, uh, dealing with DevSecOps and agile, uh, uh, agile methodology. And so they wanted to get that feedback from vendors and they want to be specific. They also actually allowed pictures and graphs to be included as part of that response as well, which teams took advantage of. And they actually wanted that as part of it. And it was unlimited for those pictures and graphs. Uh, so as you can see here, after the first phase was done, they had received 15 vendors in response to the first phase submission. And it took them, uh, it, they went to use a firm down select process between the phases, and they down selected to only five vendors in that second phase of the competition, where they had a written PWS and price as well. And so as you can see here on the right side, under innovations, these are all the different innovations that this team used as part of the procurement process. They made an award in 187 days, so maybe a little bit longer than some of our quicker procurements. But still, what we wanted to highlight here is the pre-solicitation techniques that this team found was very successful, and vendors had some great feedback on as well. So the first we're going to go over here is affordability. So we're going to talk about affordability here in this section. We're going to talk about the draft solicitation shared with industry and what that is and why it is beneficial. And also, we're going to cover here involve end users as well as part of the process. All right, so let's hop over to our first one here. Draft solicitations. You want to share the draft solicitation with industry and also vendor engagement. So what was really cool about this team 
is that you know the the contracting officer as part of this request he was really excited about getting in and doing market research with this team as well he wanted to make sure the market research was done right and that they were getting the best of the best vendors as well as part of the process so he took kind of a marketing strategy approach he actually started off by directly calling vendors picking up that phone calling vendors letting them know about this procurement was coming and their program office was also in on this too they were helping out answering questions from vendor even holding one-on-one -on -one sessions with vendors as well now what's really powerful about this the shared draft solicitation with industry what he did is they shared that statement of objectives along with the evaluation criteria and send it out as part of that RFI process to all the vendors out there. Now, what's great about this is not only now can they see our statement of objectives, what it is that we want, and the evaluation criteria, uh, they can also have the ability to ask questions on that as well and have a robust back and forth as part of the pre-solicitation process rather than at the solicitation stage. Now, what this does and what a lot of teams have found by sharing the draft solicitation with industry is that it can cut down on the Q&A that takes place in the solicitation itself. It also can speed up your acquisition time because it, again, can reduce the amount of amendments that your teams may normally uh, do during solicitation process because you're allowing those questions in the pre-solicitation phase. Uh, so this is a really powerful technique that your team can actually take as part of the solicitation process. So you release out to all the vendors, allow them to see it, allow them to comment, provide feedback. And what's even great, what takes it that extra step forward is you actually engage in some industry back and forth. You can ask those questions. You can have that engagement with industry because remember, it's the pre-solicitation process. So as you can see on here, we actually have some quotes on the page as well. These are actually quotes that we receive from industry when doing post-award interviews with teams. So as part of our procurement process, like Monica was talking about, we obtained feedback from everyone that participated on the solicitation. This is vendors, so industry, uh, that participated in the process, and also the government team as well, to find out what worked and didn't work. So these are some quotes that some vendors gave us. They loved that process as part of this solicitation and definitely recommended it uh, for other uh, buyers to consider as well. Now, moving on to the next two techniques that I kind of highlighted there, uh, affordability and involve end users. So starting on the left with affordability. So this technique, they actually, uh, this technique can be used as part of that draft solicitation process, okay? And the USCIS QISD, remember I said that they use this as part of the process. We actually have a pill cast out there right now, and it's on our YouTube channel, that's right. The DHS pill has a YouTube channel. Uh, we have uh, 13 episodes now, a 14th episode coming out soon. This is micro learning uh, on different pro federal procurement innovative techniques. So I highly recommend to check that out. Uh, one of our team members will probably post it in the chat here as well for you to take a look at that. Um, but what's really cool about this is that, uh, is that this team, they share their affordability statement or a magnitude of effort as part of the process itself. And what this allowed is it took the gamesmanship out of that kind of that pricing process, you know, that bidding process that you normally have with vendors. It leveled that playing field. It shared, it was very transparent, made for a transparent process, and it put vendors on notice what that estimated amount was. Now, as you look at the picture here, you know, you see all this money, right? The stacks of money. What vendors think the government has to spend on requirements? But in reality, it may not be as big as you see. You know, you see the person shaking out the change in their pocketbook, right? Um, and that's sometimes the reality of things. It, we can put out a solicitation with requirements, but if we don't convey the magnitude of services, you as the government may get pricing that isn't aligned with your requirement itself. And that isn't beneficial for us as the government buyers. It wastes our time. For all of you in the industry out here, we know it wastes your time as well, because this could be something that it's actually like a few hundred thousand dollars, for instance, on the government side. Let's say you read the actual statement of objectives, statement of work of PWS, and you think this matches up to maybe a multi-million dollar requirement. It's wasting your time putting something in in that amount when really we just needed something smaller to begin with. Uh, but check out, there's actually a PillCast episode on this USCIS uh, where Sandra Oliver Schmidt actually interviews the contracting officer and shares his experience with using affordability in the solicitation itself. Now, the other one, involve end users. 
So I know earlier on, we we're talking about agile methodology, and this is actually taken from agile methodology as well. Uh, so jam sessions or joint application modeling sessions, uh, this is part of the agile methodology framework. And this is something that's used as part of the pill process itself um, at the coaching process. So we have our biweekly meetings, but when we get to those big kind of gateways prior to getting the solicitation itself, like uh, developing the evaluation criteria, we typically hold these jam sessions and bring all the stakeholders in together as part of the process. That way everyone can have buy-in, develop the strategy together. That way it's all one strategy and there's not this back and forth emails. So it really saves a ton of time in the process. So if you don't use this out there as part of your strategy for developing the solicitation, I highly recommend you, you try it out. All right, so that's it from this story here from USQISD. Uh, these techniques really uh, improve the actual outcomes of the requirement itself. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll get them to you. I'm going to turn it over to Monica to take us away on our next story, though. All right. Hopefully, let us know in the chat if you're enjoying story time. But the next story we really want to highlight is from our external, one of our external coaching projects. I said National Park Service. Now, this team for National Park Service is actually awarded a $250,000 Crane River Creole National Historic Park Cary Interpretive Exhibit Design. And so Cary intended to use its headquarters in Natchitoches, uh, Louisiana, to serve as a primary visitor center for their park. All right, and so it was providing visitors with information about the plantations and African-American history along the Cane River. Now this team had to get to the award quickly, and I'm sure all of us have to get to that award quickly, right? Um, the team used FAR 13.5 simplified acquisition procedures, and they were actually make, able to make an award in 33 days. So that was from the solicitation release to the CEO signing on that dotted line. And one of the things about this one, there wasn't a predecessor contract. So this team really stepped into the lab to embark on something new. So the contracting officer had actually attended a pill boot camp in late October of 2021, and then immediately reached out to the pill. And so the PIL set up that brainstorming session and provided some coaching support to assist the team in issuing the solicitation and evaluating the vendors. Now, we really wanted to highlight this story because the innovations, as you've already heard David mention, can be used for any dollar procurement, right? Complex or not, small dollar, large value, it's really about right-sizing the, the techniques for the procurements. So the program lead had actually started working with the contracting officer and they had posted an RFI through GSA and SAM, uh, but the majority of their responses ended up being open market. So at that point, they used FAR Part 12 and 13.5 procedures. Now, this team used a suite of what we refer to or we group at the pill as the efficient evaluation techniques. So, and these are five techniques that are really, that you may wanna, you know, maybe write down, but down selects, if you've heard of those, a confidence ratings, on the spot consensus, oral presentations, and streamlined documentation. So these are efficient evaluation techniques. Most of our successful projects have used these particular techniques to speed up their awards. So this team used what we call an advisory down select. They wanted to keep the submissions from vendors light, considering it's a simplified approach, but even if you were in 15, you could use it there. But for phase one, they just requested a five page submission on prior experience, prior experience. Um, and then to really add value to the experience submissions and to really understand the real exhibits that the teams had created before. They wanted to see what the contractors had done before. They actually allowed them additional five pages to use pictures to show their completed exhibits used in the prior experience volume. So not only was it written, but they also got to a chance to look at some pictures. Now, this team with that advisory down select, because what you're doing is hoping to many offers in that first phase, a few offers in that second phase, but the team received seven responses um, in response to phase one, that prior experience. Now, this was designed to really be quick. And so the team also used confidence ratings. And they use those confidence ratings in lieu of traditional adjectival ratings. Um, if, you, if you've used the adjectival ratings before, let me know in the chat. But the Adjectival ratings, as we know that uh, outstanding, good, that way, can really limit evaluators to certain ratings based on having a number of strengths or weaknesses, or, um, and it's just not as flexible. 
So sometimes they can just overly restrict the evaluator's ability to assign meaningful ratings. So those confidence ratings, they're high, some or low, that's all it was, are another form of adjectival ratings, but they're a more holistic approach. And so the team went through their evaluation, just as usual, documenting all their noteworthy observations, but instead of counting strengths and weaknesses and plugging into a score or giving a note to that five point traditional adjectival scale um, or even doing a numerical score, the team use a subjective approach. And that does a really great job of determining, how, describing how the team's confidence in the contract disability. So that high, some or low confidence, that was their rating scale. And this team also, just as similar to the story that David just shared, they included an affordability statement in their solicitation to assist the quoters with really assessing the magnitude of the services to be performed during the contract performance. So right there in their solicitation, they said, hey, we estimate between 200K to 360K to meet all the requirements of these plans, right? But they had the flexibility to award at or lower or you know exceed that figure if they did. All that language was built into their solicitation, all about flexibility. So these are just really impactful and allowed that team to get through those seven vendors um, in that 33 days. So we can go to the next slide. Moving into their phase two, we really wanted to highlight their oral presentation structure. Now, so seven vendors, how many vendors do you think were in phase two. There are seven vendors in phase one. Let's just take a guess. I have no context. Just give me a guess in the chat and I'll give you the answer. <laughs> Pamela, you're right. For those who said four, it was four. Four vendors made it to phase two. Three took the advice. So they actually sent the letter and said, hey, we don't think that you'll be a viable candidate for award. This is just advice. You can still move forward. But they had, we tell teams to give at least 48 to 72 hours for the vendor to actually decide if they wanna to move to the next phase. So four vendors made it to phase two and they came in, if you're looking at there, of how that, sh that pitch, they came in for a pitch and it was only 15 minutes, just a 15 minute pitch. So that was their oral presentation, but the pitch itself actually allowed for the vendors to have five slides and a 30 minute interactive Q and A with the NPS evaluators. So. And that's a really short oral presentation. Let me know in the chat if you've done an oral presentation and maybe how long it typically was. One of the things that this team did, they had oral presentation with an interactive dialogue. We see it there. I see some say one hour, 60 minutes. So just imagine a 15 minute, right? 15 minute oral presentation that the vendor has, 30 minute Q&A, just that approach. But one of the things, the pictures, right? They had to bring in the pictures and the interactive dialogue were just really invaluable in selecting the right vendor and the right approach. So you really wanna determine pre-solicitation, what is the value and what you really like to see from the offers during evaluation. So it's really important to right-size the procurement techniques. This team right-sized even their oral presentation, 15 minutes, we've seen longer, we see in the chat. Um, it just depends on the complexity and what's needed. You can even ask a few scenario questions or on the spot questions um, of each offer. This is what that team did. And then each offer would get that same question and provide a response. Now, this team, they had realized about a 27% cost savings from their IGCE. And these are just really, <laughs> the, the team, the customer just really excited to use this approach. So there are really a lot of pre-solicitation techniques that can really directly feed into the actual solicitation and actually, you know, with these stories, right, we really want to recap some of these very techniques. We can move to the next slide. All right. So remember, in the pre-solicitation techniques itself, we uh, were focusing on that affordability, that kind of developing that evaluation criteria, being strategic with it, and also those uh, sharing the draft solicitations and involving end users. And uh, what we want to do here is um, we want to share some definitions with you guys of the pre-solicitation techniques we talked about. Also, we want to share some information, again, the definitions on the, uh, the post, or I guess when the solicitation is posted, that evaluation techniques. So you guys have them as a resource. Uh, these can also be found out there on the DHS PIL uh, website. Uh, so that's the external facing. For anyone out there that is uh, inside the DHS, 
you can find it on the internet page and you can find it in our yearbooks. We have pill yearbooks out there. There's actually a link uh, in the actual presentation itself on our last page. Uh, we can access our yearbooks directly uh, from 2020. Um, so be sure to check that out. Uh, so we'll go through now and we wanted to allow time for questions. Uh, so we've seen some questions in the chat. I'm starting to kind of answer them as well. And, um, and so, but we wanted to allow time for everyone to ask questions on any of these techniques you learned today or just in general, and we could take a few minutes here to answer them. All right, Monica, do you see any here in the, uh, oh, sorry, Shonda, go ahead. <laughs> That's okay, sorry, you, you jumped, you, you skipped a slide and so I, I didn't have my, my mouse ready. Um, so we do have a few and um, I'm gonna go through them and if for something is, you know, you, you don't wanna answer or you can't answer live, it's fine. Um, so let's see, how are you keeping a level playing field for all vendors if only select vendors are allowed to meet one-on-one -on -one with the program office? Okay, so that right there, so think about this, um, that's in the market research phase we were talking about there, about meeting one-on-one -on -one at the program office. And in the market research, you can have one-on-one -on -one conversations all the time you want. It's in the FAR as well. It's an encouraged to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with the vendors. Once the solicitation is out there, that has to end though, right? Uh, so we have to be fair and transparent. But during the market research stage, you can go out, ask questions to everyone in industry. You can have market research with one-on-one -on -one vendors, anything you want. It, the kind of It's open play field. As long as we're consistent, we're not promising anything to one vendor, or sharing inconsistent information as well. Okay, thank you, David. Um, can you talk about how the evaluation process should be structured when doing um, a best value trade-off procurement versus the evaluation process for lowest price procurement? Um, and then the, the note says, I'm concerned about whether a pass-fail evaluation can be used for a best value trade procurement. Please advise. So I would say we wouldn't necessarily encourage a pass fail, right? When we're, if you were doing an advisory down select, you want to use that confidence rating. We encourage teams to use the confidence rating scales. So high confidence, some confidence, low confidence. If you're using a pass or fail, maybe you're having some sort of firm down select. But um, with that itself, when you're doing, and I want to make sure, I want to look at that question. If you're doing lowest price technically acceptable, right? There's no trade-offs on that. But if you're doing your actual trade-off, um, you want to be sure that you're kind of making it, you may have some things that are pass fail, but maybe relook at it as a confidence rating scale. How can you rewrite that to be high confidence, some confidence, low confidence? And I'll give a quick example. We have a team who um, right now that we're coaching that they needed a brand specific, um, at least they wanted a brand specific software as a service. But the team is now been, is will be doing a no brand, uh, no brand justification. So in, in building their advisory down select, they're having to create those things where what they would like for that system to have. And so they're going to be using those confidence ratings. Okay, uh, thank you both. And uh, with that, we, we do have quite a few more questions and we will get those to you all to answer um, in, our, in the written format. And uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to turn it back over to Mary. Thank you, Shonda. Really great session, guys. We've got a lot of comments in the chat and the Q&A will get followed up. I know there was some interest in the pill boot camps and, and so on. Continuing on with our next session, we have Mike D'Alessandro, Branch Chief for Federal Acquisition Service Customer and Stakeholding, Stakeholder Engagement, Jonathan Evans, our Seesaw Program Manager, and Shauna Weatherly, a fast procurement analyst. They are here to talk about some pro tips for clear requirements and performance standards. Take it away, team. Thank you and welcome everybody. Happy afternoon. Um, just let me know if you can see my slides. I think they should be up now. Yep, they look good, Michael. Excellent, all right. So I am joined with, uh, well, first I'm Mike D'Alessandro and I'm joined with Jonathan Evans and Shauna Weatherly. And today we're gonna to talk about some pro tips for clear requirements. Uh, we have a short session today, but by the end of this, you'll have some tips and tricks uh, that will help you the next time that you have to write your requirements. So before we get into those tips, I'm gonna start with some foundational information here. Talk about, you know, why is writing requirements so hard? Uh, and there's a lot of different reasons for that, but we've listed out a couple of the reasons here that I want to go through. So the first is uh, having an ambiguous need. So anybody who's 
tried to write uh, before has realized it's sometimes difficult to convey thoughts in a clear method. That's why people go to school for English degrees or why there's the whole plain language campaign by the government. Uh, but there's particular ways that you can use the active voice um, or ways to structure your paragraphs that make it easier um, and less ambiguous for end users. The next is resisting the urge to gold plate requirements. Um, you know, using words is really important. It's specific words because uh, you don't want to get into a scope creep scenario. You want to really make sure that your requirements are all always traceable back to an actual need. Next one is having too many assumptions. Um, it's Assumptions are always going to be out there, but it's important to know that you may have assumptions, but to also know that other people are going to have assumptions and to make sure that you understand what all those assumptions are so that you're on the same page. And if you're not a subject matter expert in whatever uh, requirement you're trying to write about, have no fear. We have some links at the end of this presentation uh, that can help you when you're writing your requirement. If you want to learn some more information, uh, we also have some good examples that are linked there as well. And overall, though, why it's so difficult to write requirements is because there's there's high stakes involved. You know, you're using taxpayer money and you want to make sure that you use that uh, money efficiently and that you also satisfy your end users need. So those are a couple of reasons why it's you know difficult to write requirements. So let's jump into a couple tips and tricks that you can use the next time that you are writing uh, your next requirement. And I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan. I think we're going to Shauna next. Oh, That's sorry, Shauna. That's there right. No worries. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, um, what we've got going here is uh, the first tip being words matter, right? And and words are what we're trying to get down in our requirements. And it can be really cumbersome once you're writing those with a team or yourself, trying to get all that together and the time it takes and the editing that it requires to go through that. And most of us are working on a short time frame, right? While we're writing requirements, we don't always have the luxury of time. Uh, one of the things we want to make sure we're doing is reviewing and continually editing for grammar, punctuation, and format. We do that as a normal course of business, but one of the things we don't always look at is the chance to edit for the overuse of technical jargon, acronyms, generalizations, catch-all phrases, style, and even consistency. And I'll admit I've been guilty of using some of the generalizations I'm going to talk about, like the contractor shall perform services, including but not limited to. That's one of a good, that's a good generalization. Maybe using some words like robust when you're describing a contractor's program or appropriate in terms of an action you want the contractor to take. Um, at the time when we use those, we feel like maybe we're maximizing the government's best interest, but it also produces risk and the need for clarification during the solicitation and proposal phase and also later during performance. So there can be a tendency to over rely uh, on these generalizations uh, when we're trying to allow for the broadest interpretation of a requirement. Uh, when words matter really is getting to the point that we want to use precise words and plain language. We want to decrease that government risk and we want to aid industry in making sound uh, bid, and procure, bid and proposal decisions and then meeting ultimately the government's requirements. So I would suggest, uh, and my pro tip would be, take a look at your requirements from the lens of plain, consistent and concise language. The first bullet I have up here is say what you mean. Um, I was a contracting officer, chief of contracting, used to uh, review a lot of uh, requirements and it would never fail um, that I would have to ask one of my project managers or SMEs, you know, what does this really mean? What are you trying to say? And they would say, well, I'm just trying to say, keep the plant going or keep the plant operating or keep the water safe. And I would say, you know, let's let's try and call this down. Write that down. That is your requirement. So say what you mean. Don't don't talk around it. Also, say it once. Uh, cross referencing between sections of your requirement to avoid saying the same thing differently is really important. It minimizes the chance for uh, saying the same thing different 
differently. And it also minimizes the chance of risk when you say maybe using different terminology, you might call something one thing and, and you call it something different in another place. Um, that goes down to the fourth bullet being consistent, avoid using different terms for the same concept or, or, or object. In some places we may call something a cancellation and in another place we may call it a suspension. For example, I, I was writing the smart pay requirements and found that we were calling those things uh, the, the same thing in different places and they have distinctly different meanings. So uh, whether or not a, a charge card would be canceled for a holder or um, suspended. And then also use the simplest terms, uh, use the most familiar and common words that you can find. Uh, Plainlanguage.gov has a great list of words and phrases that weaken your writing. Things like using the word carry out or start instead of implement or using the word begin instead of commence. Uh, the plainlanguage.gov lists gives uh, the 12 biggest offenders out there. They're in bold. So you can see if you use any of those and it'll give you tips on how to find the simplest words and terms. And there's also uh, federal plain language guidelines out at plainlanguage.gov for you. And it's a really good read. Uh, it's a really good exercise to go through and look at that and uh, using that to, again, go back and take the chance to edit your requirements because words do matter. Uh, Mike and Jonathan, do you have any tips you'd like to share before we go on to the next? Only that I love that picture of Will Ferrell, but I think you were <laughs> spot on. <laughs> Isn't that the truth, right? So Absolutely. I think our next tip is Jonathan's. Yeah, I'm going to try and sound photosynthesis here, um, as per Will Will Ferrell there. Um, so the biggest tip I can give all of you, and I, I realize trying to to share with you all best practices for writing uh, clear quality requirements in 15 minutes is uh, somewhat of an insurmountable task. Um, so, a couple salient points: one, work on it together as a team. Um, as Shauna said, she's worked with a lot of program offices where she said, what do you really mean by this? And so sometimes it takes an outsider, someone outside the program office to ask the question, what do you really mean? What do you really want to get? Um, so that brings me to this format for writing requirements, which is called action result context. The most important aspect of this action result context format is the result. What is the result or outcome that you are looking for? We have a tendency in government to write uh, rather lengthy run-on statements, as you see here, this original statement, uh, and it's not necessarily clear what exactly the result or outcome is going to be. Um, and so when I was coaching the team that had this statement in their draft document, and I pushed them to tell me, what is the result or outcome you're looking for from all of this? They said, well, one of the things we want is uh, a new methodology for data collection. Oh, okay. And is the contractor going to provide that to you? Yeah, they, they're going to need to create it. Okay. So here now we've got a result, a clear result, data collection methodology. And what are they doing? They're creating it. They're not uh, just delivering it. They don't already have it. They're going to have to create it. It doesn't exist. Okay, and then the context for that. Uh, why are they creating it? Who are they creating it for? All right, so once you do that, now you have a, a clear, plain language, precise statement of need. The contractor shall create data collection methodologies for internal or external data used in support of whatever it's being used for. Uh, another thing that they said um, is that they're going to need um, some some processing, some preparation, some management of internal and or external data. So um, one of the results that they're going to get is that data, and it's going to be prepared, processed, and managed. Now, we could push further with this team and ask them, well, what do you mean by managing the data? And that would be a great next question is to dig into that. What does processing the data look like? What does preparing the data look like? Um, so you want to dig in, you want to ask those questions. Is it clear? Is it understandable what we are asking the vendors to do? Um, because what happens is when we put out these solicitations, if we are not clear about what we are looking for, um, industry has a lot of questions. And I know our industry folks on the, on the conference today will, will back me up on this. Um, 
they use their either they'll 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 ask the question during the solicitation phase. Um, if not, they'll make their best educated guess. Um, and that doesn't always align with what the government's expectation was at the beginning. So be clear about it. Make sure you understand what results and outcomes you're looking for. And then use this format of action result context to craft your requirement statements. Um, and don't allow them to become giant run on paragraphs. Uh, and we'll talk more about that here in a couple slides. So let's uh, go back over to. Uh, That's me. The, all right, Michael, you're back on. <laughs> yeah, we got a round robin here. Uh, and, and I love that part. It's, you know, what you're talking about, Jonathan, is it's all the same information, but it's how you word it and how you. Um, uh, like how you use your words differently to uh, get the same message across. Um, it just becomes really much easier to read. So as for assumptions, though, what I'm going to talk about is uh, sometimes people are fearful of assumptions. They don't want to ask about assumptions. They just assume that people know everything. Uh, well, I'm going to come out and say that assumptions are a good thing because uh, the way that I or anybody views whatever they're writing, you have to know that somebody else may assume something else and have a totally different assumption. So it's really important to understand what your assumptions are. I'll give you an example. I used to work at Raytheon and when we submitted proposals to the government, we, were, we spent a lot of time on our assumptions because we wanted to make sure that the government knew exactly what we were assuming and uh, so that they knew what they could expect. And assumptions could be as simple as, you know, we uh, assume that the government will provide XYZ GFP, or we assume that the government will finish project A so that we can start project B uh, on X date. And that's how we're coming up with our timeline here. Uh, but for industry, you should list out your assumptions in your proposals. Uh, to ensure that the government understands where you're coming from. And from the federal government side, if you are unclear or you feel as though uh, you're unaware of what assumptions are, ask industry what their assumptions are. You can easily do this in your market research phase, uh, ask about assumptions, or when you're doing your proposal evaluations, you can ask for clarifications or have some type of communications with industry at that time as well talk with your contracting officer, of course, before you reach out to industry. But that's the importance of assumptions. You want to make sure that you are all on the same page. And I'm going to turn it over to Shauna. Thanks, Mike. Um, you know, when you talk about assumptions, one of the things we get into is you want to list a lot of things uh, so that you don't miss anything, right? When you start listing assumptions, sometimes the government wants to say, well, we're assuming X, Y, and Z. And, and sometimes that can turn into a long list, but how do you get that list going so you avoid this um, giant paragraph of doom is what I like to call it. Uh, there's really, really tough to avoid this, especially when you're writing complex requirements. You have a lot of tasks, maybe a lot of deliverables, maybe a lot of checks that have to go on throughout the performance process. Uh, you all know what I'm talking about. It's that insanely huge, long, seemingly insurmountable paragraph that just goes on and on and on and on and on, right? With everything but the kitchen sink in it. It just never ends. Um, it's really discouraging to a reader. It can be very discouraging to industry when they're trying to pull out what they assume. Again, going back to assumptions, we think is the most important in this giant laundry list or even down the road, um, I've been a COR, a contracting officer's representative, trying to actually work with contractors to go back and determine what did the, con the government mean when we wrote the requirements and how to enforce those, picking and poking through these narratives to make sure that we've uncovered every possible task, location, description, or deliverable that was uh, desired and required, right? So, uh, I'm a visual person. I really, really like breaking apart long paragraphs. And what I've got here on the slide are really some examples from the last requirements I wrote. Uh, you can see the long bulleted giant paragraph of doom there on the right, or the left, excuse me, my other right. <laughs> and then you can see samples of how I've taken that paragraph and broke it apart uh, either into a bulleted list uh, a table or some other diagram or display 
where the same information could pre be presented uh, differently. And it's nice to kind of break it up. Uh, it's a quick way to reference information, especially during performance. Uh, but also if you're pointing to different sections of your requirements for let's say uh, responding in, in the proposal for industry, they know exactly what requirements you're pointing to exactly uh, down to the most concise piece of the requirements that you need. So. Again, going back and editing through your requirements to see how can I present the same information in a different way that provides clarity and conciseness and um, doing that over and over as much as you can pulling out those um, visuals to to help uh, make things easy to find and easy to understand. And with that, Jonathan, I think I pass it on to you. Yeah, and I know we're, we're over time, so I'm just going to make one quick uh, pitch here on the useful links. So um, if you are at a federal agency um, and you have a requirement and you want help working on strengthening your requirements and setting up your acquisition strategy, um, reach out to us at seesaw at gsa.gov. Uh, we have a workshop that is designed to help you. It was mentioned by Kelly Seacrest earlier during the category management presentation. Um, we will help you and your acquisition team uh, through the process of developing your requirements and talking through your acquisition strategy. So I posted a link in chat. Uh, if you're interested in uh, more information on Seesaws, please reach out to us and we can help uh, get you plugged in uh, and get you writing better requirements. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mike, Jonathan, Shauna. I love the giant paragraph of doom. That's, that's a great word for the day. Um, next up on the agenda, we're pleased to introduce a couple of presenters that are going to discuss strategies to attract, train, and retain program managers across the federal workforce. We have Dan Baer, Department of Commerce Program Management Director, and J.C. Schult, Program Manager. Thank you both for joining us, and the floor is yours. All right, awesome. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. JC Schulte, uh, currently serving in the role of the senior advisor to the Federal Acquisition Institute and the Office of F uh, Federal Procurement Policy. Uh, for whatever reason, I'm viewed as a subject matter expert when it comes to program management. So I am here to serve as uh, Dan's opening act before he goes into his presentation. Um, so, all right, uh, try and get this next slide here. All right, for whatever reason, uh, Mari, it will not allow me to change the slides. Okay, uh, I think you have to share your presentation, JC. I think it, right it. now it's still on Adam Hall. Yeah, got it, sorry, I was trying to request, um, no ask the request control, but there we go. That's Perfect. Wrong. All right, can you guys see the presentation? Yes, looks great. All right, outstanding. So I'm gonna be fast and furious because Dan has the body of the content that everybody is going to wanna see. So a couple of things that we wanna go through a lot of the keys to maturing uh, program and project management workforce. So a big thing coming out in the not so distant future that OPM has been working on is they're going to have a unique job identifier for the program and project management uh, individuals in the federal government. So a lot of people think program management and they automatically assume the 340 series. Well, interestingly enough, in my normal day job, I'm actually a 501 financial analyst, uh, but I, all I do is program management. So with that, uh, it's going to be really interesting to see how they go about identifying all of the different program and project managers in all of the different job series. Um, so with that, uh, in my slides that you guys will get, there is a fly sheet for the program management series that goes through a lot of the different competencies um, and how they plan on implementing the job identifier for the program managers. Along with that, they break it down the difference between a program and a project. Uh, with the project, it does go into a little bit more depth, more granularity in regards to what a project is, talks about a temporary endeavor uh, with, a gear, or with a specific start and end, with, and as well as uh, end product. Um, so there's the job identifier. 
within that, they have identified 32 general and 19 uh, technical uh, competencies. Those are not just related to acquisitions. I know FAI has their own acquisitions related uh, technical and general competencies for project and program management, as well as DAU or Defense Acquisition University. Um, but they will have the interpretive guidance for those uh, project manager positions to break that down further for help. Um, so another tool that's out there to help with uh, the project and program managers that OPM has put out is the CEDAR tool, which stands for competency exploration and uh, for development and readiness. Essentially what the CEDAR tool is, a, is going to do is allow the uh, supervisors to have an opportunity of looking at their workforce, identifying skills gaps and saying, okay, what training are they, do they need to get us or get them to where they need to be? Um, so again, it's a dual rater system. With that, uh, the individual is going to rate themselves as well as the supervisor. So uh, here's your steps to maturation. Um, you want to identify your program managers. You want to conduct a gap analysis of the populations. Um, a beautiful thing that uh, you're about to see from Dan is this tool that he built out. Um, it's amazing. It does awesome things. The CEDAR tool does similar things, but uh, Dan's done, goes a little bit further. And then once you've kind of gone through and looked and identified those gaps, you're going to have the ability to go in there and you know say, okay, here's the training you need. Let's build out your individual development plans and let's make you the best program or project manager that you possibly can be. Uh, another key aspect of this from a maturity standpoint within agencies is looking at how you can develop department-wide foundations uh, and standards for program and project management. All too often, you can't pick up a program manager from organization X and drop them in Y because it's completely different as far as the standards and what they're expected to do. So one of the big things for me is supposed to do with the Program Management Improvement Accountability Act is to standardize those things, make it more uniform across the government. That way we have a better way of getting forward uh, within the program and project management realm. Um, so like I said, I am Dan's opening act. I will happily quickly take a couple of questions uh, or we can go ahead and hold those until after Dan, your guys call. Uh, I'll answer those in the chat as we go along. Dan. Thanks, JC. Great opening act. Let me see if I can share my screen with you all. All right, are you all seeing what I'm seeing? Yes. Perfect, all right. So, so JC touched on something as kind of the, the impetus for this talent management challenge, which was the Program Management Improvement Accountability Act. Uh, it came out in late 2016. So I'm gonna cover a little bit of the background of why we did it. So you, so you can kind of understand it when I actually show you the tool. Uh, and see what we what we actually did with these requirements. Um, so so PMIA came out to to generate improved mission uh, accomplishments and program performance across each of the twenty four CFO led civilian agencies. Uh, it was mostly focused on improvement to cost schedule and performance, as well as the ability to match PM talent to mission requirements. So about a year after PMIA came out and was signed into law, OMB released M1819, which was focused on three key strategies of an overall five-year strategic plan of how those civilian-led agencies would implement PMIA. Uh, strategy one was on a coordinated governance council. Uh, all of these things were set up fairly quickly. The PMIO, or the Program Management Improvement Officer, uh, as outlined in PMIA, had to be a senior executive employee, uh, and at most agencies that was dual-hatted with their senior procurement executive, as is the same here at Commerce. On strategy two, they were looking for regular agency reviews and, and portfolio reviews, with OMB included in some cases. Um, again, that was fairly easy for Commerce because we've had a uh, a matured uh, um, acquisition program management life cycle, much like the DOD 5000 or the NASA 7120 series. Uh, that ours was implemented at Commerce in 2012, so it's been around for about a decade. Uh, and we have a milestone review board 
for those mission critical and high risk programs that is chaired by the deputy secretary. Uh, and that's my other day job. Um, and strategy three was strengthening the PM workforce and professionalizing the PM workforce. This was a longstanding challenge. Uh, when PMIA came out, the first two, again, to commerce came fairly easily to kind of not check the box, but ensure that we could perform both of those functions. But the third one, as JC mentioned, OPM was identified in PMIA to produce a job identifier. Um, as we wait for that to come out, we needed a fix to, to identify them up front. And so the real challenge was not just identifying and tracking the PMs, but then being able to provide um, you know, career development or care and feeding strategies for them. And we knew and was also identified as a requirement in PMIA that each of those agencies had to do a program management gap analysis to see who they had, um, what competencies and certifications and life cycle experience existed or didn't exist, and how to fill those either through targeted training or other um, you know, talent improvement strategies. And then ultimately, to be able to match the PM talent with mission needs. Um, and the tool that I'm gonna show you here in a second, I'm actually gonna do a live demo of it. Um, we've been able to do that. And we're actually running internal details for groups, bureaus, or program offices that require a PM anywhere during the traditional or agile or even hybrid phases. Um, and we're using this system as basically a talent management solution for the department. So I've developed a couple of ServiceNow solutions. So, you know, when I picked up the requirements for this, when I was brought over to the Office of Acquisition Management and the Office of the Secretary, um, I kind of knew what I already wanted to use because I'd already done it a couple of other places. Um, and so I, when I went through the analysis of alternatives, it was really easy choice to just go with ServiceNow because it was something that I was really familiar with. Uh, and I had previously done it a couple of places. Um, but what I did was I created a custom table design, which uh, creates user profiles. Um, so if anyone's familiar with ServiceNow, um, user profiles are created and stored in the system in a series of tables. Um, and what makes it really easy for a talent management solution is, is that uh, once you populate that user profile, you can go back and you can repopulate it. You can change your answers. If you get more years of experience in something, you can make the updates. You know, you get a PMP and you want to make that update in your profile. Um, you can make those. It is a live automated talent management solution that doesn't go away. Um, you know, unlike running SurveyMonkey or a, or a Microsoft Forms for a survey to capture folks, it wasn't a one-time thing where we did it, it became shelfware and it went away. Uh, this is something that is, um, it's live today and it will be forever. Um, the other benefit is, is that because <clears throat> Department of Commerce specifically uses ServiceNow for its IT infrastructure, uh, those user profiles were also in there for that. So if a department employee leaves Commerce for another federal agency or outside of it, uh, that user profile is shut off with their email account. So I never have any sale data in the system. Um, and that would be unlike some of the other tools that are out there for the federal workforce where, you know, you run a, a search in the tool and you find 12 people that don't actually work there anymore, but you can't tell which ones they are. Um, so we never have any stale data issues. We're also talking to HR about adding the survey link to the onboarding checklist. So we're capturing anyone new coming in. Um, and it captures all the things down here in the bullet points. I'm not gonna bore you with reading through them one by one. Instead, I'd rather actually just show them to you. So let me stop sharing for a second and um, pull up. So the system actually knows who I am 
when I come in here because it's connected to single sign on and active directory. And you'll see these grayed out boxes when we go in here. Um, so up here, it knows who I am. It, know, it knows what bureau that I'm already assigned to. Um, the supervisor drop down that's connected to the global access list. So I can search for any, any person in commerce on here to find a supervisor. But I also added this manual checkbox for organizations that wanted to take this tool. So um, as I haven't mentioned yet, we are giving this solution to other federal agencies for free. Um, I built it for $40,000 sunk and non-recurring, and it costs us about $200 a year to maintain it because every user that uses the survey front end functionality is an unlicensed user the way it was created. So it costs us very little to maintain it um, and it's free to anybody who wants it. So these top boxes here on occupational series, uh, these were added because we wanted again to be able to match PM talent to mission needs. And this just wasn't for uh, internal detail opportunities. This was also for integrated product team or project teams across commerce for other mission critical programs or program reviews and analysis where, you know, if you wanted to have an engineer on the team who has a PM background, I can find them because they entered their OPM occupational series in here. That's really helpful because it's not like asking somebody if they know engineering. If you're an 0855, OPM qualified you that you 100% have a four-year degree in engineering. So this made it a little bit easier here that we could actually search for those fields. These bottom four down here, these are conditional statements, uh, meaning if you answered no to all four of those, the, and you click the next page, the survey would thank you for your time and close because you did not meet the initial requirements for taking the survey. <coughs> Excuse me. The purpose of doing these conditional statements was so that um, we didn't have to run a broadcast for commerce and have people make assumptions that, um, oh, I'm, I'm, Bob and I came from Booz Allen Hamilton and I was in PM work 10 years ago, um, but I'm not in one now. Maybe I shouldn't take the survey or shouldn't bother. Um, instead, we sent this out as a mandatory release survey to all commerce employees to take the survey for the people who did say no to all of these questions. Um, it took them a grand total of 30 seconds. And for the people who answered yes to one or more of those, it took them eight to 10 minutes. So it's not a huge lift either way. And it removed any issues of people not taking it because they weren't sure if they were supposed to or not. Um, so again, if you were to answer yes to one or more of these questions, you would progress through the survey. Uh, anywhere where you see the little question mark here, you can click a drop down. It gives you the uh, description for that information. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so here, you know, we're looking at uh, master's level certificates in project and program management. If you were to say yes, you'll get a drop down for a prefill. Um, this is the only place in the survey where you are prefilling information that is not a selected drop down. Uh, the reason why I didn't do that in more than one place is because that creates a massive amount of data to go through where somebody capitalizes something differently or spells it a different way or uh, adds a random word in somewhere. Um, it removes that, it removes the, uh, the inability to do that data mining or making it more difficult. Um, and, and on that note, while this is transversing to the next page, myself and one other federal employee did a PM gap analysis for all of commerce holistically and then separately for each of the 12 bureaus in three and a half weeks. So the tool makes it really, really easy to do the mining. <clears throat> and it was really fast. It was super easy. And anybody who's any of the federal agencies who are looking to take this as a free solution, we're happy to work with you and show you how it works and, and work with you through your gap analysis. Um, so this is on traditional and agile life cycle phases. So 
Again, we kind of talked about the two opposite ends of the spectrum on traditional and agile and hybrid in between, iterative waterfall, things like that. Um, and we broke these down, these each of these phases by years of experience. And we did that for a couple of these other pages as well, as I'll show you. The reason for breaking them out by years of experience is a <clears throat> previous lesson learned from one of my other developments where, <coughs> excuse me, where, you know, if you ask people yes or no binary questions, knowing if someone knows concept definition isn't really helpful if you want somebody to come in and take over a, a brand new IT development program. That doesn't give you a lot of uh, insight into their background. Uh, down here, we have the Agile project management as well. And uh, there's a spiral methodologies on here. Um, so in case you know that, that's on here as well. Uh, on the next page, we're getting into technical competencies. So JC mentioned the CEDAR tool. The CEDAR tool has 15 competencies. Um, other federal agencies vary from 18 to 25 to 30. You know, everybody's a little bit different. We were a little bit more inclusive than the CEDAR tool. Uh, it's no dig on the CEDAR tool, but <clears throat> in some cases we wanted these broken out where CEDAR tools, all of their competencies are the same. They just might've combined say contracting and compliance together. We wanted them separate. We also have some DEWIA specific ones on here. And again, anywhere where you see these question marks, It'll give you the description. This isn't Dan Baer's made up assumption of what these are. These are <clears throat> directly from the source. <clears throat> so on certifications, again, we wanted a system that wasn't just capturing the PM workforce that was feds. We also wanted to capture people who might have recently come from the private sector or come a decade or two ago um, that we wouldn't have otherwise captured. So you'll see a lot of private sector certifications on here, like Scrum and your PMI certifications. Um, you know, again, these are all conditional statements. So if I say I have a Lean Six Sigma, it'll ask me what my belt level is. <clears throat> and additionally, on that last page, the importance of asking for the PMI certs is, is that we're identifying the folks who came from the private sector where having a PMP is a great thing. And it, it's a great thing even in the federal government, but PMI doesn't cover federal contracting. That's what the FACT PPM certification is for. So we wanna ensure that if we have a bunch of federal employees who have a PMP, again, great news, but we also wanna ensure that if they don't have the FACT PPM that they start working on. This is the last page. Um, this is specific to commerce's mission space. <coughs> So we have things like space and satellite acquisition, IT, so on and so forth. We have a wide commodity area at Commerce where you know, people don't really think that we do ships and satellites and aircraft and you know, major IT programs, uh, radar systems. So we have a lot going on here and we wanted to make sure that we could overlay those OPM occupational series specifically with technical experience by years of experience in each of the acquisition phases. And what we've told other agencies who have taken this as a free solution is, is that this last page isn't gonna be relevant to everybody, right? So we gave this solution for free to EPA maybe two months ago. They're probably still working on testing it and deploying it right now, but they would have changed this page to make it specific to EPA's mission set. The benefit is, is that all the coding and the table creation is already the hard parts done all you're doing is changing the name the 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 uh the acquisition phases don't change depending on where you go these are all the same all you're doing is changing what mission sets you're looking at the only thing else on this page is that there's an added attachments uh there's a notification up here to strip any pii it wasn't a mandatory that people submit a resume, but it is available for people to add that to their user profile if they're interested in career development opportunities. So now I'm going to switch over to the back end. So there's a bunch of different dashboards in here. Again, they look complicated. They're really not. 
uh, you run a report and then you just export it as a dashboard later. Um, <clears throat> these are just things that I've created over time. And, uh, you know, so these are all live links. If I click on the 389 PMs at NOAA, it would tell me who all they are by name, you know, their contact information, their supervisor, their supervisor's contact information. Um, you know, you can look at, you can look at mine, right? So if you look, the back end is mirrored almost exactly to the pages that are in the survey itself. So it's easily laid out to see the information. Um, and the one piece that I wanted to, not this, the one piece that I wanted to show you on here that JC kind of touched the surface on was this idea of OPM occupational series stretching over the workforce. So uh, when we did our PM gap analysis, this was one of our first upfront slides for leadership. Um, again, you would assume that like the 340 series, the program management series would be the highest number of these folks. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's like six down the list. Um, all in all, uh, this other column kind of maxed out what the dashboard could handle. Um, <clears throat> there's 104 different job series across our PM workforce at Commerce. So unfortunately, even when the identifier does come out, until you can identify who those people are, you might be able to identify the 340s because it'll be the easiest one, but you know, how would you ever identify 155 22 tens of the IT workforce? Um, that would be, <coughs> again, pretty impossible. Um, and then even in the certifications, this in my mind is easier to look at even than DAU CSOD because I can go in and identify exactly who the level threes are at NOAA or in the secretary's office. Um, there's a lot of um, interesting visualizations you can do here. Um, and I think that's about all I have for today, but certainly if, uh, if folks have questions, if folks are interested in, again, taking this as a, a free solution back to your agency, um, feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to make that connection. And we've done so quite a few times already. Thank you. All right, thank you both, uh, JC and Dan. That was wonderful information. Um, I think for the sake of time, we will allow you all to answer any questions that you had on the Q&A document. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, we have got one last poll and then we're gonna wrap it up for the day. And we appreciate those of you who are still here with us. It looks like that is quite a few. We're still around 1700 participants and that is wonderful. So I'm gonna execute this poll. Let's see. That's not right. Here we go. Would you like to learn more about any of the following sessions or topics? Advancements in market research, procurement innovations, writing requirements, or talent management for program managers? All right. Looks like we've got quite a few respondents. I'm going to end the poll and share the results. And it looks like pretty much split. Um, procurement innovations and writing requirements look like they might have won, but it looks like you all are interested in everything that we've talked about today. And we really appreciate your attentiveness to, to, to today's sessions. Mary, back to you. Thanks, Shonda. Um, yeah, I love the answers to that poll. I think that we cover all of that in our monthly series as well. So um, July 20, go sign up for our furniture and furnishings event that's coming up. We're going to be talking about all those things. What a great first day of our three day event. Be sure to join us tomorrow because we have an agenda packed full of amazing guest speakers, including a keynote address from Assistant Commissioner of the Offer Office of Enterprise Strategy Management, Ms. Charlotte Phelan, an industry panel discussion led by the Coalition for Government Procurement President, Roger Waldron, along with special guests from across industry and government. And don't forget, all attendees will receive up to three CLPs for each day. I hope you all enjoyed the information provided. Your CLPs will come to you automatically because you logged in 
So watch for that in your email after the event. Uh, as a reminder, recordings of the sessions will be posted to the GSA website in about 30 days. And CLPs will be coming to you within the next couple of weeks. You will receive a survey on Thursday, thanking you for attending and asking you to fill out the survey. So please take the time to complete the survey on Thursday and let us know what you think of the event this week. Thanks again for attending today's event. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern, 12 noon Central. And if you're in another time zone, reach out. I'll let you know what time it is for you. Have a great evening.